Let's talk for just a minute about the exam topics. For the MS500 exam, there are four main categories that the objectives are taken from. The first one has to do with implementing and managing identity and access. So lots of questions here about Azure Active Directory and how to configure that properly. Implementing and managing threat protection is the second category. So the Defender products uh, come into play there. Implementing and managing information protection. So things like Azure Information Protection and how to manage uh, data loss prevention and things like that for the third category. And then the last category is managing governance and compliance features in Microsoft 365. And there's a great link down there at the bottom of the slide that shows uh, some of the topics in a little bit more detail. So ready to get started? All right. In section one, we'll be looking at configuring and securing identities for Microsoft 365. This section is going to cover things like the different authentication methods that you can use how to set up and manage conditional access, implementing RBAC and uh, privilege identity management or PIM for those higher privilege activities. And finally, how to manage Azure AD identity protection. One of the key things that you'll be expected to know for the exam is which authentication method to choose when you're setting up the environment. The primary choices that you'll have to choose from are the three that are listed here. First, you'll have cloud authentication, where all of your identities reside in the cloud, and uh, authentication is handled exclusively by Azure Active Directory. <clears throat> we don't encounter this scenario all that often in uh, production, because most companies typically have some form of on-premises identity system that they have to integrate with Azure AD. The second scenario is directory synchronization with uh, either password authentication or password hash sync. Uh, this is probably the most common of the scenarios and is the one that most customers deploy in production. When a company has a security requirement to immediately enforce a, uh, a condition on a user account, for example, locking a user account, or if there are password policies that have to be uh, implemented or sign-in hours, then pass-through authentication is the authentication method of choice for those types of customers. And then the last scenario is federated authentication. Now with federated authentication, Azure Active Directory hands off the authentication process to a separate trusted authentication system. And usually that's one that's on premises and it typically goes through something like ADFS. This type of authentication system is typically used for more advanced authentication methods where that's a requirement to meet uh, compliance regulations. So things like smart card based authentication or multi-factor authentication provided by a third party is typically uh, the use case for single sign on with ADFS. So it's important to remember all of these uh, models for identity and when they might be used. To help you in that, it's a good idea to, uh, when you're preparing for the exam, to refer to the diagram that's shown here and that is located at the link down here at the bottom of the slide. This chart will help you understand which type of authentication method to use given a set of requirements or given the answers to certain questions. So make sure you look at the comparing methods section of this page uh, and become familiar with the logic that is defined here. Another thing to make sure that you're clear on is the different topologies that are supported for Azure AD Connect. So for example, how would you set up Azure AD Connect for a high availability scenario? Well, you'd set it up with a staging server, but how would activation of that staging server work in practical terms? What would the failover process look like? Or if you have multiple on-premise Active Directory domains that you need to synchronize to the cloud, 
or if you have multiple Azure AD instances, what sort of scenarios for Azure AD Connect are supported there? Document that's listed here at the bottom of the slide would be good to review so that you can make sure that you understand the supported topologies. It's important also to track the health of your Azure AD Connect environment. And so one of the things that you're likely to be tested on is your understanding of what type of events are significant and how you would resolve issues related to Azure AD Connect. For example, if you're experiencing extranet lockouts with ADFS, how would you identify that? How would you resolve that type of issue? Or how would you identify and resolve issues related to failed sign-ins? And closely related to that is where would you find the alerts related to these types of events? You'd look for it in the Sync Service Manager Operations tab. And there's a link here at the bottom of the page that you can review for additional information on how you would identify issues that are impacting logins through Azure AD Connect. Self-service password reset is an Azure Active Directory feature that allows employees to reset their passwords without having to contact IT staff. So one of the things that you'll need to know is how do I enable users and groups for self-service password reset? Additionally, it's important to know what the licensing requirements are to set up self-service password reset. So the self-service password reset feature that you use is going to be dependent on what kind of a user you are. In other words, are you in a hybrid configuration that would require the capability of doing password right back from the cloud? Or are you fully in the cloud? Also, what is the task that you're trying to accomplish? Do you want to change your password? In other words, you already know your current password and you just want to change it. Or do you need to reset your password where you don't know the password and you need to set a new one? Those are different scenarios and they require different licensing abilities for the users. So again, make sure you read the licensing section down here as well as conceptually how uh, self-service password reset works. Azure AD access reviews. So these are important for ensuring that users have access to the applications that they need, referred to as access packages. And then when that access is no longer required, how do we revoke it? So it's a good idea to understand the process for performing an access review to see if the user still needs access to certain tools or, or data. But as with many other things in this exam, um, it's important to understand the licensing that's required and also knowing the minimum permissions that someone would have to have in order to perform a set of tasks. One of the key elements that you'll be required to know is the different methods of implementing security for sign-on scenarios. So for example, how would you provide secure logon access to an on-premises legacy application? Well, in that scenario, you might be able to use an Azure AD application proxy. What about if you're implementing Azure MFA with RADIUS authentication? Well, you need to know that a network policy server was, uh, is going to be required, and it would be important to know the steps involved in that implementation. So again, read through the links on the page to understand these and other types of sign-on scenarios. And more than just implementing MFA, it's also important how to monitor MFA. So for example, would you be able to tell why multi-factor authentication has been denied for a certain user? Or what type of MFA was accepted for a user's sign-on? And just like with many other Microsoft exams, 
knowing how to do things in PowerShell is always critical. So the example that's given here is identifying users who have been registered for MFA. So knowing how to do things like this are important in the exam. So this example was taken directly from this link. And there's some other examples that you might want to become familiar with so that you understand the structure of these PowerShell commands. <clears throat> Conditional access is a set of controls that allows you to automate responses to login attempts by checking to see if the user or the machine involved um, or that's trying to log in meets certain criteria. Now you can create groups of users <clears throat> or groups of devices for conditional access management. And these groups can be either statically assigned memberships or can be dynamic membership. In other words, um, Azure Active Directory will look at attributes of the user or attributes of the device and then add them to the group um, that's relevant for them. <clears throat> Conditional access can also require the device to be marked as compliant or that the device be hybrid Azure AD joined as a condition of granting access. And lastly, you can run a what if policy tool to validate that you have your conditional access policy configured correctly before you actually roll it out to users. And since device compliance is a big part of conditional access, it's important to be able to track when a device has fallen out of compliance and why. So to see that information, you can review the device compliance dashboard. It's located in Intune. It'll show you the device's current compliance state, as well as if you drill down into this, it'll show you what setting is out of compliance so you know what to fix. Concept of RBAC has been around for a while now, so I'm not going to delve deeply into how to set up RBAC, but it's important as you prepare for the exam that you think about what the minimum permissions are that would be necessary to accomplish any given task. What I mean by that is for any task that you perform, think about this type of question. Using the principle of least privilege, which of the following roles will allow me to perform this task, right? So for anything that you go through um, in preparing for the exam, think about what the RBAC role is that would allow you to accomplish that with the least amount of privilege. Privilege Identity Management, or PIM, is used to define who is allowed to request elevated privileges in an organization and how long they have those privileges when they've been granted. And this is a key element in establishing the concept of no standing privileges for administrators. So for the exam, remember that it requires an Azure AD Premium P2 license and make sure you understand who is it that requires that licensing? So it isn't just the users that request the access, but also users that uh, perform or assign to an access review need that licensing as well. <clears throat> it's a good idea to set this up in a test Azure AD tenant so that you understand the flow of the setup, in other words, how you set up PIM in the Azure portal. And also, it gives you the opportunity to verify the privileges that you need to accomplish things like viewing reports or performing an access review. Uh, going back to that, what is the least amount of privilege I need to accomplish this task? With PIM, you also want to make sure that you know where to go to audit and monitor the users who have requested elevated privileges so that you can track any misuse of those privileges. Make sure that you understand the difference between sign-in risk policy and user risk policy. Uh, we'll talk about the user risk policy on the next slide. 
but with sign-in risk policy, we're showing the risk of a user's login at the time of their sign-in. And so this is something that you would be tracking uh, for browser traffic and sign-ins that are using modern authentication. Uh, it doesn't apply to the older security protocols. On the other hand, user risk policy looks at the behavior of a user over a period of time. So your user risk policy might be watching for things like impossible travel scenarios, as one example. That means it would have to be watching the user's login attempts over a certain period of time, not just at the exact time that the user is attempting to log in. They'd have to have a history of those logins and when they took place and where they took place. So just make sure that you understand the difference between the user risk policy and the sign-in risk policy. And finally, just like with all the other scenarios discussed, you have to know where you can monitor these types of events and what options are available to you to respond and react to these events. Uh, so make sure you read through the documentation uh, here at the bottom of the slide to uh, understand where risky sign-ins and user risk um, are identified and managed.